My name is Paul Novaris, as he just mentioned. Um, I work for a company called Anchor. We do a couple of open source projects called Sift and Gripe that generate software bill of materials and then check those software bill of materials for vulnerability matches. Um, I'm not going to talk too much about that today, but um, I am on uh, Mastodon. Um, if you go to my Mastodon profile, there's a link to these slides. Uh, the slides have a lot of footnotes, and all my speaker notes are in the slides, which you won't see on the screen today, but they're in those slides. So if you, if you do miss something, take a look at them. Um, the agenda, I'm not going to give away all the good stuff right at the beginning, uh, but um, everybody wants the silver bullet right at the front, right? Uh, the bad news is there's not one. And this is a pretty dismal talk. Uh, there's not a silver bullet. There's a lot of bad news. And there's a couple of things that might be good news at the end. So it's not all bad news. Um, but the first thing, I'm just going to go right into the really bad news. Um, here's some headlines here. These are recent headlines, right? Log4j, it's almost two years ago. And like 40% of Log4j downloads are old versions. This one says 29%. At first, I thought this is people like pulling old Docker containers. No, this is like people going to Maven Central and getting spe a specific version of Log4Shell or Log4J that is too old. People are pinning their dependencies, whatever. I don't know, but it's a radioactive nightmare, right? Fukushima was what, 11, 12 years ago, and they're just still cleaning that up, right? So, I mean, we're always going to, we're going to be dealing with this for at least 10 years, maybe more. Um, it's, it's, it's like a big radioactive Godzilla. Uh, so that's the first thing that's really depressing. Like, we've made very little progress in two years. Uh, even though everybody, this is like probably the most well-known zero day in a long time, and we still have made just a little bit of progress. Um, so when I saw that, I was like, oh my God, it's really bad. Okay, move on to something that's not quite as bad, but still bad. Um, everybody's seen this, this metaphor, the iceberg, right? It's a really old metaphor. I've used this, I've used this slide a hundred times. Uh, I've criticized this metaphor a lot. Um, and I went back and I was like, how old is this metaphor, right? And I actually went and found a presentation from 2009, the exact same picture, right, using this metaphor about open source. Uh, and I think it's really kind of outdated because really what's going on, it, this thing at the top is not your application, it's actually your dependencies. This is the thing you know about, right? Your direct dependencies that you're explicitly de defining. And all of the stuff down here, these transitive dependencies that you don't know about, right? So like log4j, it specifically, when Log4Shell dropped, who had heard of Log4J before that? A few people, right? I mean, who here had Log4J in their stuff that they had deployed and didn't know what it was? Okay, really plugged in crew here. But a lot of people didn't, right? They had no idea. So this stuff is just buried in here because of transitive dependencies. And what's really happening here uh, the way we've built software has changed radically in the last 20 years. You know, the, in the old days, and again, I'm going to like age myself here, you know, you, had, you were doing your programming in C and you had glibc maybe, and you know, there was no way to just snap your fingers and get a bunch of libraries installed, right? You had to maybe go specifically find one and download it and maybe try to install it, or you had to pay somebody a million dollars for a networking library or whatever but you couldn't just snap your fingers and get NumPy, right? And when you install NumPy, you get a bunch of other stuff that you don't really explicitly want, but you get it, right? And that's where a lot of this stuff is happening. All of this explosion in open source and these transitive dependencies have massively increased the, you know, whatever you want to call it, attack surface, whatever, for supply chain attacks, right? I mean, these guys are going nuts. 
Um, and just to illustrate this, there's a, in the, in the footnotes, there's a link to this um, blog post from uh, Josh Bresser's about how big open source actually is. This is just no, NPM packages, right? Going back to 2011, um, I think NPM was introduced in like 2010. I mean, there's like 32 million now, and this is at the beginning of the year, so this data is a little old. Um, but even more impressively than this, uh, this is the number of new packages per month. There's almost a million a month now, right? There's been proposals and, uh, you know, hey, we need to do security reviews to some of this open source stuff, right? The most ambitious proposal I saw was we can do security reviews on 10,000 open source projects a year. There was no real you know, proof about how they would be able to fund this or get the manpower or whatever. 10,000 is probably like impossibly optimistic. But we've got a million new ones a month, so even if they could hit that goal, it's like, you know, we're doomed. Um, so, you know, this stuff is just piling up. It, you're, that part of the iceberg, going back to the iceberg, right? This is just getting bigger and bigger and bigger every time you do a new build. Everything you, you depend on is depending on more and more and more and more. And all of this stuff is just, it's out of control. Um, so, to get a little more depressing, right? This is a survey from early 2020, uh, about maybe six months after log for shell uh, We asked people, you know, what did you do in the days after? How much time did you spend identifying applications? A ton of time. Remediating? A ton of time, right? Um, now, one thing that did come out of this, we did a case study with a major mm, manufacturer of uh, networking equipment, and they had actually did all of the identifying and remediating in less than 24 hours for their entire enterprise. And the reason was they had already, they were producing software bill of materials for all of their workloads. Um, because of that, they didn't have to go back and scan everything to look for Log4j. They just basically ran JQ through all those SBOMs and pulled out exactly where the problems were, what needed to be rebuilt and deployed. And they had it all done in less than a day. Um, now, that sounds great. It's really like, oh, it sounds like a silver bullet. Well, hmm. The problem is, you know, SBOMs do help a lot, but they're not perfect. Um, they're not a silver bullet. I don't want to oversell it. Um, the problems, SBOM, uh, the scanners that produce SBOMs are not perfect, right? Uh, particularly, they're very bad at, like, penetrating uh, binaries, right? So, like, Log4j sticks out like a sore thumb because it's, like, even if it's in a jar, inside a jar, inside a jar, you can still find it. Things like, just a few months after this, though, OpenSSL, there was a problem in OpenSSL 3. Um, it turned out like a lot of publicly available Docker images had OpenSSL statically compiled into, in somewhere in there. Scanner can't see it at all. Every scanner failed on that. Um, you know, then they go and do like a one-off, oh, well, let's look for this particular signature, right? But that's all reactive. There's no way None of the SBOMs that were produced before that would have found it. You know, so again, not, not perfect. Um, the other problem with SBOMs is they're not ubiquitous. Uh, people who are producing software are the ones who should be producing the SBOM, not the consumers. The reason is, since scanners aren't perfect, you need the producer, whether that's you know, a project maintainer, whether it's a commercial supplier, to correct those SBOMs where the scanners are not perfect. And the other thing is, if, even if your supplier does give you an SBOM, it's very difficult to incorporate that into your project and say, okay, I'm gonna use this SBOM as the foundation and here's what we started with and here's what I built on top of it, right? That kind of tooling is very uh, experimental. Um, on top of that, SBOM management, extremely difficult. Um, you know, having this database of SBOMs that I can just JQ through on, an, on a whim, you know, it doesn't, it takes some effort. Right? I mean, a lot of people just produce them and then they just stash them in a, as a build artifact and maybe I'll come back and find them later. You know, I don't know. Um, so that said, you know, the SBOM endgame, you know, it's just not very clear right now. Uh, there's a lot of things that have to be resolved. But 
in general, producing SBOMs is better than not producing. It's better than doing nothing. We'll figure out the details later. Um, one other thing, SBOM is like a real generic term. There's like, CISA has defined like six different types of SBOMs depending on when you generate it, what you're generating it from. Is it from source code? Is it from a, a build? You know, is it produced during a build process or after a build process? Those are all different types of SBOMs. They're not all compatible with each other. Um, but I would recommend, if you're interested in this, there's a project called SBOM Everywhere. It's an OpenSSF initiative. There's a working group there. They're doing a lot of effort on this. Uh, I would check them out. That's in the footnotes as well. Um, okay, going back to this explosion of open source, uh, this is a graph of ransomware attacks. And, you know, it's kind of, uh, there's a couple of them here, and then all of a sudden it just explodes. Again, right, this is kind of, if you look at the data, this kind of tracks with that explosion of open source, explosion of transitive dependencies, attack surfaces are just much, much, much bigger, right? I don't think this is a coincidence at all. I don't believe in coincidences period. Um, again, kind of depressing. All right, moving on. Uh, what we don't know, uh, the other thing we don't know. Uh, this is about a week after log for shell no, a couple of weeks. Um, this tweet, there's almost 10,000 CVEs with the same CVSS score as log for shell Oh my God. Well, yeah, that CVEs have I actually took this and said, you know what, this is it. This is the event that will break the camel's back. Everyone will realize CVSS, CVEs are broken. We can't, they're not really serving the purpose anymore. Um, and then a year ago, I kind of used this as to show how wrong I was. But now I actually think this may have been right. It's just taking a lot longer than I thought it would. Uh, <laughs> there are a lot of problems with CVEs in the CVSS scoring system, the main thing is it's a very opaque process. There's not much accountability. Uh, it's very difficult to get additional information into those advisories. Um, you know, it's, it's a Kafkaesque nightmare. There's a Daniel uh, Steinberg who runs Curl just recently posted a, like a blog post kind of documenting his nightmare with the CVE authorities. Someone, just an anonymous guy, just did a drive-by report of a security vulnerability in curl. What it was was a buffer, not a buffer overflow, an integer overflow, did not have any security implications at all, but it got scored a 9.9. .9. Uh, so he spent, I don't know how much time a lot of time trying to track this down. Who reported it? What did they actually think was going on here? Here's why it's not a security vulnerability. I mean, just hours and hours and hours of time. And just reading it is infuriating. It's just like, oh. So, okay, well, if not CVSS, then what is the question, right? What, I mean, we have to have some way of kind of classifying all these vulnerabilities. Which ones are we gonna prioritize? All of that stuff. Um, the number one thing is GitHub has started their security advisories. They take the CVE data, they add context to it. There is an open public discussion where people can add more you know, context and uh, information. Um, they generate machine readable feeds from it that are very easy to consume. Um, you know, I mean, there's a lot of refinement and discussion that goes on in, the, in those GSHAs. Uh, there's a link to that in the, in the footnotes. Um, a couple of other things. Uh, CISA publishes a known exploited vulnerability list. Also uh, machine readable uh, feed. Uh, this stuff is really high quality, right? There's like maybe, maybe currently like 200 items on this list. These are vulnerabilities that have been seen to be exploited in the wild, right? If you've got something that's on this list, you need to fix it immediately, right? This is stuff that is, you know, actively being exploited. Uh, obviously, that number's gonna grow over time, but, I mean, it's very manageable. It's not an overwhelming, you know, fire hose spraying in your face constantly. Um, another one, EPSS. Uh, if anybody was at uh, the Kube Community Day here Tuesday, that, there was a lightning talk on EPSS. It's a, essentially, 
um, a system to, I'm not gonna get into the details, but another scoring system that is a little more focused on con, you know, what's exploitable in context. Um, it's also uh, got a little more accountability and transparency. Um, very experimental now, but I mean, a lot of tools are starting to adopt it. Uh, another thing called VEX, which is a vulnerability exchange protocol. Uh, it's basically a way to, uh, VEX works really well with, with SBOMs in particular. It's a way to say, hey, there's these things that will pop up on a security scan. Here is the information as to you know, why this is not vulnerable or this is vulnerable. It's just a way to transmit to your consumer uh, all of the extra context you have about particular issues that um, might be in in those, uh, in the packages in that, in that software. Uh, one other thing that's not really related to vulnerabilities specifically, but around just information in general, is uh, GitHub publishes these things called insights. Um, a lot of people are starting to use this information as a way to evaluate open source projects that they're gonna consume. Like if before I like you know build my entire business on an open source project, I probably want to know, you know, is this a single maintainer? Uh, do they actually fix things? You know, will they work with me if I submit a PR? You know, uh, those kind of things. So there's a lot of data here that you can look at that kind of gives you an idea about, um, you know, the health of a project. Um, you know, this is. Currently, the people I know that are doing this is a very manual process. I mean, the only people I know that are actually doing this for production code now uh, are producing like embedded devices that have like a very long lifespan. Um, and they also have a very small number of dependencies. <laughs> so, but this data is again, machine readable. You can consume it, you can process it, and you could probably make some decisions, you know, at the, at the macro scale. The other problem with this is though, a lot of times, even if you have a project with a red flag, maybe there's no alternative, you know, developers are gonna use what gets the job done. Uh, again, I don't really advocate today, like necessarily using this as a gate, but it's more of a context, like giving you some insight and just giving you some awareness about the software you're consuming. Um, just to illustrate this point though, going back to like the things like, this graph is from that same open source is bigger than you can imagine. This is the number of maintainers on, again, this is just NPM. Uh, at first I was looking at this, I was like, what am I looking at? Uh, there's all this stuff down here. This is actually the number of projects with one contributor maintainer. If this gets, you know, if you, this guy gets hit by a bus, what happens, right? Are you ready to fork the project and take responsibility for it? You know, just again, something to be aware of. It's not something you can necessarily fix, or maybe you can go to them and say, hey, we, we really want to use this project, but you know, we're, we're willing to work with you, maybe. You know, I don't know. Just to, again, just be aware. Um, so many projects are just you know, a, a guy doing a passion project in his spare time, and you know, he's kind of out there on his own. Uh, okay, that went a lot faster than I thought, so we'll just recap here. Um, again, log for shell radioactive, it's Godzilla, it's immortal, we're never gonna get rid of it. We don't know what's in our software. We have to get better guidance, right? This is, this one is, whoops. This one is actually one that is getting better. This is the one kind of like bright point in what we're doing here. Um, two, uh, going back to this one, how software gets made, just insanely different, right? If 1999 me saw what's going on in 2023, I, I don't think I would, you know, I would think this was like 2123. Um, one other thing, there's a lot of eggs in GitHub's basket. I mean, this is kind of another thing that 1999 me would be really weirded out by, like Microsoft is really like propping up a lot of the open source ecosystem. <laughs> um, and they're the good guys now, right? Um, Red Hat's the bad guys and Microsoft's the good guys. Uh, yeah, it's really weird. We're in the upside down. Um, the other thing is like, 
everybody wants these definitive gates, like this is good, this is bad. And, you know, reality is obviously messy. Uh, a lot of times, even if you know the right answer, it's impossible for all kinds of logistical reasons. Humans are, you know, a disaster. Uh, but we have to just think about risk and what's tolerable and what's not tolerable. I mean, we all tolerate risk on a daily basis, right? You get in a car, right? That's taking a risk. But hey, I need to get somewhere. The risk is pretty small. The payoff is pretty big. So that's the main thing is think about, you know, probabilities, probabilistic thinking. Um, one other thing I did not put on here, please don't pin your dependencies, man. That, that, that's the number one thing. Like, that's what's causing this. People are pinning dependencies and we're gonna be building, you know, log4j into stuff forever. Uh, it's categorical imperative, right? Do not pin dependencies. I don't know, please don't quote me on that. Um, okay, that's it. Uh, you know, that, like I said, that did go a lot faster than I thought. I went through this um, like 19 times because I totally redid these slides uh, this weekend because of a couple of things that changed. And I really thought this was gonna be closer to time, but hey, it's good, it's lunch. Everybody's ready to go eat. Um, I'll be around for open space. Uh, if anybody wants to get into an argument about any of this, you know, I'm, I'm ready. Uh, even if you wanna just argue about like, you know, GIF or GIF, I'll argue about that. I'll just pick a side. Um, thanks a lot.